Okay. Um, yeah, so I'm very excited to have this conversation with Rob and Jonathan, and we're still waiting on Jordan. And I just thought I would say how this conversation uh, came to be. You know, I, I said to them that Twitter made me do it because um, I've had these relationships with each one of these, I think, um, exemplary uh, young men in different contexts. And in my life, they, they live like Jonathan lives over here and Rob lives over there and Jordan lives over here. And for some interesting reason, we found ourselves on the same thread. And then Carrie Dugan said, wow, one, a long time ago, I dreamt that the four of you were all in a room together having a conversation. So I always pay attention when people have like these subtle level type of intuition things. And, you know, it's like the universe is saying, you have to do this, right? So that's like Twitter, Twitter made me do it. And um, <clears throat> so, uh, so that's how it started. And then um, I asked <clears throat> Twitter, what, you know, what do we want to talk about? Um, because the the internet, the interworld, the metaverse sees each of you in those silos. And you know, so so what's the thread? And then uh, the the response that was highlighted on Twitter is, what is it like to be a father? You know, so we have these phrases, a time between worlds, the meta crisis, the great reversal, uh, the great transition. And this is kind of an interesting opportunity to describe a journey of fatherhood. Some of you have older children. Jonathan has younger children. Jordan, I'm not sure if he is going to have the opportunity to join, but he has both a, a group of older children and a, and a new baby. So how I just want to invite you to first say who your children are and how old they are, and then maybe try to take a kind of a process view of like, wow, here's me with my children and here's the world changing. And what challenges have that made? I mean, do you look at the future through your children's eyes if they're a certain age? Do you feel that your children, if they're older, are moving? with your ideas of the meta crisis? Um, how do you negotiate between, um, you know, kids, the whole future is ahead of them. But a lot of the work we're doing is all about climate collapse and economic collapse. And how do, so those are things that I would assume you're trying to navigate. Um, and um, so we'd be really interested in this first round is what is being a father in these unusual times? So we're gonna go in the order that I've met um, met you. I first met Rob around 2010, I think. Uh, my first encounter with him was that he was kind of yelling at me from about six inches away, very intellectual uh, conversation. Um, I met Jordan, I think for around four years later. I met Jonathan around four years later than that. And it's about four years since I met Jonathan. So this kind of interesting cycle um, in this group. So uh, yeah, so Rob, can you, um, can you run with that prompt? Sure, uh, I can do my best. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm, I'm Rob Smith. I'm the CEO of Enter to Life. For 15 years, I've been uh, one of the, uh, I guess, putative leaders in the diversifying integral meta theory movement. Uh, also a father, as Benita said, of three children, a nine-year-old boy, a 12-year-old uh, going on 25-year-old uh, girl, and a 14-year-old uh, boy. Uh, we, knowing that we wanted to raise our children integrally, and I'll unpack a little bit about what that means, I suppose, um, we believed that we needed to keep them somewhat outside of the conventional socioculture, um, or at least have kind of a, you know, a way in which that relationship was managed to some degree. So we homeschooled them. Uh, we homeschooled them for the first uh, 10 years. 
uh, and now they've just gone to conventional school this past year. Um, let's see, I'm trying to answer your uh, questions, Bonita. Uh, we think a lot about the very things that you bring up, constantly thinking about how to help them um, become, in a sense, I, our eye is on how do they become integral adults? That's always in the back of our mind. How do they become integral adults? How do we help them um, learn to be present? How do we help them learn to serve something bigger than themselves? Uh, how do we help them uh, be passionate about something without a lot of fear coming into the mix? Uh, we understand that there really are three interacting domains as it relates to the children. Uh, there's who they are. There's the, you know, their innate temperament, their typologies, their brain structure, the patterns they have, um, any core fears that they kind of came into the world with. Those are things we need to be attuned to, and we try to be. Uh, and I can talk more about those, but, you know, I've got an Enneagram 2, I've got an Enneagram 3, 4-ish, and I've got an Enneagram 5. You know, we know what, the, we, we know and talk to them about what their signature strengths are, for example. Um, and so sort of making those things, those kind of, uh, uh, awareness of their psychological patterns and what have you, an object for them and us to work with is quite an important component of, of that process. Uh, so that's one domain who they are. Uh, the second domain is who, who are we, uh, who am I, you know, what are the ways I show up? What are the things that trigger me? What is, you know, how does my my wife show up, what are her strengths, shadow, all of that kind of thing. And what is the core values and practices that the family is, the, the container of the family uh, introduces and kind of uh, uh, perpetuates over time. So we started training the kids on the family's core values, there's seven of them, um, when they're three years old. And, you know, we would talk to them about them all the time, we'd ask them about it at dinner. And we know that that's also a developmental process. There's a very simple way they might understand them, you know, when they're young and there's a little more advanced way they might understand them now. And then hopefully there's a far more advanced way they'll understand them as they grow into adulthood and they'll um, see why we put them in the order we did. And it, it, there's a kind of a spiritual metaphysic behind uh, that whole process. Uh, and then finally, the third domain is what world are they growing up in? And as you said, it's a, it's a very complex world. Um, the socio-cultural environment that they're enmeshed in between social media, the values of, you know, the very, very real differentiated cultural value war that the U.S. and that most of the Western world is enmeshed in right now itself between traditional values, modern values, postmodern values, and then right at the leading edge, these kind of more integrative values. That's a very, very hard thing for any child to kind of navigate. And so how do we help them do that? How do we help them integrate it so they can see what's partially correct in all of these value structures and then, you know, bring them internal. So um, I'll, I'll stop, we could go on, but, but I think our job is to try to hold that, you know, sort of broader awareness and then always show up with uh, uh, almost, I think of it as kind of a Christian sense of kenosis, a self-emptying love of teaching them and, 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 and modeling for them the way in which we are their bond servants, to use Paul's language. Uh, we are the bond servants. We, we, we want them to experience the world fundamentally as something that is innately loving of them and that they can love and that that is their divine identity. And that over time, we hope that that deepens and that we can at least be part of the stewards of that process. Right. And then, and then, Jonathan, if you can set up your situation and then just go ahead and have a cross conversation of, wow, what was in there that really is intriguing for you from the other would be great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bonnie. And uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm grateful to Bonnie for setting this up. It was a very tender invitation to be seen as fathers in a context where that's kind of invisible most of the time. And also for Bonnie, who is, of course, wise, as you all know, no doubt, will recognize that that influences our work and perception in various ways, albeit sometimes quite subtle ways. Um, 
so I'm Jonathan Rowson. I'm 44 years old. I have two young, well, youngish children. Uh, Kailash, my eldest, is now 12, and Vishnu is uh, six. And as you can tell by their names, their mother is Indian. And that's quite a big dynamic in our family. So I am Scottish, white, obviously. Uh, Shiva is from India and brown. We met when we were both students at Oxford University. Uh, we actually met, met learning to meditate. We learned TM at the same time at the end of 1998. Um, and lots of things happened in interim, but eventually got married around 2015, uh, sorry, 20, 2005. Uh, and um, children appeared a little bit later. Now, I only mention that because I'm reminded of the saying that the, the biggest challenge in a man becoming a parent is not so much becoming a father, it's becoming a husband to a mother. And I find this quite a perceptive statement, albeit it is a soundbite. It, it is a tweet, Bonnie, apologies. But, it, but, it, but I find it actually speaks to my experience quite closely. I don't think it's easy to speak of what it means to be a father without also speaking of what it means to be a co-parent. Um, and every family is different. Every dynamic is different. Um, there's also a sense in which the whole question of what it means for your culture to influence parenting comes into the picture. Because um, in many ways, Shiva and I are quite similar, you know, similar educational backgrounds. We both had somewhat un challenging upbringings in various ways. It wasn't, we weren't, we weren't particularly well parented ourselves, although I'll qualify that in various ways with all due respect to our parents. But there was certainly turbulence along the way. It wasn't sort of a very safe, conventional upbringing for either of us. Um, and that's relevant because, and th and th although in that we were quite similar, um, in many ways you really feel the cultural difference um, about everything from how you eat to when you eat to what to encourage, what not to encourage. So a lot of our parenting challenge has been the challenge of having a united front because we're very aware that that's important for the children. We're also aware how difficult it is. Um, it, isn't, it isn't straightforward. Um, I should add perhaps that Vishnu, uh, as a six-year-old is an absolute delight he's a you know literal bundle of joy he's, he wakes up and he starts playing and he doesn't really stop till he conks out at the end of the day um, he's full of sort of schemes and things to say and he doesn't stop talking and as you might know from my twitter stream occasionally he says something quite profound um, he's recently got quite into chess and that's of interest to me because i used to play professionally uh, and it wasn't particularly pushed by me, but the chessboard was there and one thing led to another. Um, so he's quite a cute, as a character, he's very kind of light and playful and not particularly focused or determined, but just sort of happy-go-lucky and a little bit of a struggle to learn to read and write and things like that. It's a bit longer. COVID didn't help, of course. Kailash is a completely different character. He's 12 going on 25 too. Um, and very quick to want to become an adult. He's just a couple, you know, he's up to about my, just above my eyebrows now. So he's already almost the same height as me, even though he's 12. So that's quite scary actually, um, because he can be quite challenging. He's got a, I don't know, I don't know the Enneagram quite as well, but I would venture to guess he might be an eight. There's quite a strong sense of challenge and confrontation about him. Um, and, uh, and yet he's also very studious and brilliant. He plays the violin, he plays the piano, uh, he he is a scholar at his quite good school, um, but he doesn't try that hard. He kind of he's a bit. He's like I feel as though he'll turn it on when he has to. He doesn't sort of like to overexert himself now. So I would say compared to Rob, although it's just a, a sketch, of course, in both cases, my sense of being a parent has been quite turbulent. It's been uh, I think I called it a joyous struggle. I mean it's. It's been uh, deeply, deeply rewarding. Nothing more fulfilling or meaningful has ever really happened to me. On the other hand, exhausting and exacting. Um, and it goes on like that. And in the, the book I wrote about what chess taught me about life, I bring parenting into it at some point. And I'm reminded of uh, Milan Kundera's unbearable likeness of being. He, um, he begins with a, quoting Nietzsche's idea of eternal return. And he says how... The basic view of time as being something that sort of uh, keeps coming back means that each moment is sort of unbearably heavy. 
It's like what you do now, you will do for eternity and perpetuity. That's the kind of underlying metaphor of the, um, the uh, eternal return. Whereas a more linear notion of time is like every, every moment is kind of evanescent and passing and fleeting and light. What you do now um, doesn't matter. Something else will happen in a minute. And I realized that in my chess experience that, that ultimately it's a light game. It's a game where you set the pieces up and start again. But parenting, I think, is quite a heavy game. It, there's a sense in which you feel the decisions you're making and the things that are happening will live on. There's a sense of I have people who ask me, you know, should I have children? I hear it's quite hard and so forth. Um, I say to them, look, I really don't think it's about happiness. I don't think your children make you happier as such. I do think they make your life more meaningful uh, in the sense of being heavier. Um, not always. It varies, of course, all the usual caveats apply. But I think the way to understand it is it adds weight to your life, a kind of the heaviness of that, the, the responsibility you have to carry. Um, but it also um, brings with it the joy of that and the meaning of that and the depth of that. So that's been my lived experience at home for about 4,000 days or so. Um, and I feel blessed and lucky, but um, equally, I do sometimes look with envy at those who have freer lives. So Bonita, do you want to just sort of have a, do you want us to just freestyle from here? Yeah, yeah, that, you know, I wrote down some things, but yeah, uh -huh. just have a conversation and, and wherever, sure. yeah. Yeah, so there's several things that I noticed um, in what you said, Jonathan, that I'd like to maybe hear a little bit more about. You You talked about maybe a slightly non-conventional upbringing, and I, I took note of that partly because of the era we're in today, where it, it is very, very popular in a way for people to be pushing the boundaries of what is conventional. And in fact, what we would say is that from the standpoint of uh, what we call kind of the green structure of sociocultural evolution, just the information landscape, the way in which it, it acts as kind of an acid on norms and, and so the beautiful part of that is that it liberates everybody into a subjectivism where everybody can kind of feel free to explore their own identities. But of course, it's devastating for any sort of cultural, large scale cultural or social uh, coherence or, or, or unity as we're seeing. And so um, I, I think one of the things I've thought a lot about and we have, have really kind of tried to navigate the polarity is between on the one hand, being that I'm, a, I'm in a professional, I, as a professional, I am in an avant-garde intellectual and spiritual community. And to what degree do I kind of introduce that non-conventional or trans-conventional, however you want to think about it, into my children's lives? And on the other hand, to what degree do I say, nope, developmentally, it's actually quite important for them to continue going up the ladder of development conventionally, learning the kind of foundational skills you need. And then gradually, as they get older, they can make choices, having been exposed to kind of things that kind of world that we live in. And so I'm just curious, because it sounds like you had an upbringing that had some, or maybe this is not the exact, you know, right characterization, but I wonder how you think about that polarity between, you know, where we inhabit professionally, how much we introduce to our children, but also what's developmentally appropriate. Well, there's a, yeah, at least three big questions in there. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I'll start with the, the personal. Um, so when I said unconventional, in my case, that was, um, my, 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 I mean, I've, I've written all about all this publicly, so you mustn't feel I'm disclosing anything that's particularly painful. I've, I've spoken and written about it before. Um, my, my father was schizophrenic, and um, my parents sort of separated and divorced when I was fairly young. Um, about sort of seven, eight, nine, that sort of age, the sort of marriage collapsed. Um, my mom was a kind of heroic survivor, a single parent teacher who rose up the sort of professional ranks in education. She was often in debt. She used to talk to me about, I remember vividly a conversation where she explained to me that she had managed to get all of the things that she owed into one payment every month. And this is like, she consolidated her debts, right? But I didn't know, I was a young boy. And I thought that sounds pretty clever. Good job, mom. You know, I remember that kind of feeling. So I was brought up almost entirely by my mom with some help from her father, my grandfather. 
And there was a period of time where we actually moved down from Aberdeen, where I grew up in the northeast of Scotland. My mum had a new relationship and we moved briefly to closer to where I am now in London. Um, and that didn't work out very well either. And I got very sad and I really wanted to go back to Scotland. And in some ways that was quite important for my formation because I had a lot of time alone and that's where I got really good at chess. It just became my way out, my escape, my sublimation. Um, I mentioned that now, I think just to briefly add, Shiva, I won't go into quite as much depth, but in her case, I think just, you know, lots of traveling around. She grew up in Kerala that went at the time where she was in Calicut was mostly a jungle. So she spent a great deal of time being dropped off at libraries to read um by as a way as a means of childcare basically and that's how she got very studious and very very able and uh but it meant that in terms of parenting boundaries weren't always set we didn't have we neither of us had very clear stable family setups of this is how you have a family this is family meal time these are the rules these kind of things were not really in our upbringing um so fast forward to today, you have a very interesting dynamic where, I mean, I think part of what you're describing sounds like uh, something like a green blue dynamic, uh, although with a sort of background setting of orange, maybe in the, in the mix. Yeah. Um, and um, although the intellectual in me wants to put the caveat that spiral dynamics is, has its own problems, of course, uh, but still as a way of talking, it's very useful. Um, and I, I think, um, I do, I do experience that a bit. There's a lot of two things I feel at home come up quite a lot. There are a lot of futile appeals to intrinsic motivation. I find myself, despite my better understanding, saying to the kids, do this because it's good for you. Do this because it's rewarding in and of itself. Don't play the piano to get grade two or grade three or become a great musician. Do it because you love the music. Don't play chess to try and beat me. Do it because of the beautiful patterns and all the lovely ideas. I'm not sure how much they get that or can get that. They they understand things much more like do this and you'll get an ice cream after dinner. Do this and we'll maybe let you be on the iPad for a bit longer. The, the appeals to intrinsic motivation are sort of how parents feel good about themselves. But very often in my experience, the children, it doesn't compute for them very well. Um, in terms of what that means in terms of cultural codes, the other thing that comes to mind is authority. So... In a stable family, the norm, the traditional family, the norm would be parental authority holds, and you hold that by virtue of presence and confidence and conviction, but also by underlying social mores that that's just the way things are. It's intergenerational. My experience is that's breaking down, and children are no longer quite so sure that you have authority by virtue of being parent you actually have to re-earn the authority or somehow make it second nature and because it's no longer first nature at some level. Um, and that can mean that when you ask them to do something, you do often get into this spiral of, well, why should I do it? And you give them a reason and they say, that's not a good enough reason. And eventually you want to say, because I say so. Um, and you don't like saying that. It always feels like a kind of failure. And what's also interesting is that they don't really accept it. You know, and so... And we're no longer in a context where there's any kind of force involved. So you often do get this on pass of, okay, what do I do now? How do I establish my parental authority here when it's not just a given? Um, and that's a, it's an ongoing challenge, um, more so for my older son than my younger son. But um, uh, it is there. Yeah, that's 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 really interesting. Um, and I, I love that you, uh, especially that last part where you're talking about this, um, the nature of of sort of earned legitimacy and earned authority. Uh, I think this, Benita, as we talk later, because I, I know you wanted to talk a little bit about leadership. I mean, they, they're very much the same kinds of problems or, or, or life conditions affecting this question of what qualifies as legitimate uses of power these days. And I tweet about this a lot, but not just me, many people are noticing that we have a real legitimation crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, because if, again, going back to the sense of liberation, if we can all be liberated into a subjective sense making and a, a subjective ethical kind of almost solipsism, uh, our own world of, of, of ethical uh, norming, then the problem is, how do you ever legitimate a use of power? Uh, and, and the kids, of course, are getting this. They're, as you point out, they're, they're really almost like 
by osmosis of social media and these other things, even though developmentally, they may still be much earlier structurally in themselves because the leading edge, or at least just, just prior to the leading edge, kind of the, the leading edge of the Zitgeist is, is a relativistic, liberated, postmodern sort of milieu. Man, it's amazing to watch how just the transmission power of that into the kids even you know younger and younger and so i i, I also confront you know the same things uh that you do and it, it 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 just reminds me that it's the same problem we have in terms of leadership that we we have to find new ways of um allowing for the integrity allowing for a deeper uh, spiritual sense of cohesion uh and convening to stand in for or to uh, to operate as the things that give us the 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 kind of uh, intrinsic power and authority, and of course that is it is earned, uh, and it can be very frustrating as a parent sometimes because you want to say, well, as I saw with my 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 teenager, um, I guess it was two weeks ago, uh, we were having a sort of a similar issue, and and finally I said, no, I'm I'm taking this away. And he says, you can't do that. I paid for that. I said, okay, so let's make this object right here. You're about to learn a lesson in power. And so I gave him a real politic lesson right on the spot. I said, you don't have the power. I do. I don't need to legitimate this because I have the power. So for the next 24 hours, you're going to understand how some of the universe works in terms of a lesson and actually just real power differentials. And sometimes they will be exercised against you because what he continues to struggle against, for example, in school is, well, that's not fair, or I don't like what that teacher's doing or this, that, and the other. And I said, look, let's disabuse you of the notion that the world is always going to comport with your sense of the way you think it should work and power differentials matter. And then he got his phone back. And then just last week I was involved in a negotiation business-wise with a, with a uh, company that is far bigger than us, that has all the power relative to us. And that, I, I use that to, as, an, as a learning moment. I said, look, in this situation, I've got none of the power. So this is why I'm doing this in a particular way. So these power differentials are things you're going to come up against all the time. And you can't just kind of you know, scream victimhood every time you come across them, because that's what people are doing. But it's an unskillful way to recognize actually what's going on in reality. I'm just going to jump in here. This is great. I mean, this is so wonderful. I just want to thank you for the depth you're going to. So as an observer, I think I want to say that we're looking for not solutionism. Like Rob has a, a something that's working in his context. It's not just applicable to another context, but what, what are the principles that are applicable to a completely different context? I mean, we're, we're fathers in very different contexts, right? And so just, just to have us listen that way, there's some principle that is maybe fundamental to fatherhood, but it's not the solution that Rob has, is, has found because they're different contexts. So um, just orient the listening audience. I, one of the things that where I'm drawn in in this conversation is that there is very there is increasingly more access to this literature. I always talk about the work of Alice and Gopnik. Um, and she um, wrote a book called uh, "The Scientist in the Crib." And what she argues is that children, toddlers, newborns are running scientific experiments at a meta, what we would call a metacognitive level in order to understand the ob objects consistently, you know, objects constant, see? They're actually making predictions. At first, the reason why they think it's funny when they first get that you took the thing away and it's still there is because they made a prediction that it was still there because they, have a new theory of how uh, self, other, and world works. And then that happens. And so I could say more about that, but I want to go to what you're experiencing. And so what's, what's interesting is that 
one of the things children learn is like they're kicking their legs and we might put, you know, one of these toy things that hangs over them. And at some point they learn that kicking the thing made it go like that because the thing is varying with their, their movements. And they see, oh, there's, they're trying to make a theory of causality there. And then another time they may be too far away and they kick and it doesn't move. And now this, the scientist in them has to figure out like what's different, what's same. And they come to the conclusion at a certain age, well before two years old, that you have to be in proximity to objects to make them move. This is the phase at which they get on you and they, they try to make your mouth move by pulling on, you know, the, the, it's a real phase. They go through like pulling on the dog, um, because this is the theory they've come up with. Then she says, oh, this is just great. She's a great writer. She says, you know, and then like one day they're walking around, they go to touch the electrical cord and you go, oh, don't do that, right? And then the first time they do that, they, you know, you've, your voice has just shocked them to stop the behavior. When they come around two years of age, the reason why it's called the t terrible twos, They'll see you sitting and they'll go over and pretend they're going to pretend they're going to touch the thing. And, and they see you do this. Now they have a theory with people. I don't have to be in physical proximity to them to have power over their behaviors. This starts at two years old. It's a, it, it's it's runs in the background in our educational system because it's just annoying. I understand it's annoying. But what if. This is, a, this is a superpower that people have. And if we make object out of it, like, like look what you're doing, you know? Like you can make something move by doing something with your body. The question is, why are you choosing to make this movement happen in daddy? Like, why? Like you're discovering something about human relationships, right? That's very powerful. And this is where all the action's happening, actually, at this experimenting about what is this superpower I have, right? Um, so, I, so I don't know, that's my little shtick in there. There's something very interesting happening in that, that is, you know, all these things can come, come up at, in deviant forms, but what is the superpower? Uh, if, if you can reflect back, yes, when you're in relationship, there's, there's this, there's this mutuality of cause and effect. Are you exercising choice around that? Well, they're not really, because they're not, unless you reflect it back, there's just this unconscious processing that's, that's happening inside them. So I don't know if that's helpful, you know, but. Um, it did make me think of something. I mean, it, when, when you were describing, Rob, the, the challenge of sort of, creating a legitimacy somehow one of the ways you do that and it isn't easy but it's to show an interest in their world even when it doesn't seem that interesting to you so they can like my older son currently has an interest in pokemon cards i couldn't be less interested in them in some ways i mean i see the capitalist logic behind them they're basically collector's items they're, they're, there's a lot of sort of basically propaganda about how much these things are worth worth um, they're almost like a kind of analog form of cryptocurrency for children. Like it's the kind of weird setup where they think, oh, I find these cards, I can make a big profit on them and they're hunting for that and it's exciting. But I look at them and I just see a kind of trick and, and you know, a bit of a waste of time, to be honest, but I can see he's really into it. And so I do try and ask him about these cards and I, you know, he really has a lot to say about them. And when I notice that when I do that, suddenly he's a bit more receptive to what I have to say. But if I don't do that, not just the cards, but more generally, um, you know, I want to say, oh, don't do that. Don't, don't watch that thing. Watch, you know, don't watch this instead. It's so much more interesting. Or don't read that, but read this one instead. It's so much more interesting. Um, but that doesn't work. Like it, it just doesn't seem to give me that degree of intimacy or connection that I need to maintain some kind of viable authority for the relationship to work. What I need is to sacrifice my own interests and enter his world and 
show an interest in where he he's at, even if that world is a very instrumentalist logic, very egoic, uh, very young. Um, and uh, more part of you want to say, don't be like that, you know, be different. But actually, that is how he is right now. And when I go there, I find he comes closer to me, back towards where I'm at. Um, so in that sense, Bonnie, there is that sense of mutuality. Yeah, I, I, I love what you just said, Jonathan, because, you know, in our, all of our collective communities, we learn this. I mean, this is conscious listening 101, like look as not at and, you know, stop thinking about what you're going to say. Really try to kind of inhabit the world of who you're listening to in a really genuine, slow, empathic, embodied way. Um, and of course, we know that's that's actually tough. I mean, it takes it takes a a choice to do it. It takes a slowing down and a decision to do it, and then and then attending to it. And you know, when the kids are fighting over their toast in the morning, it's not always the time that you want to do that. But actually, we already know that if we do that with them, if we actually kind of get into their world and take the time to try to consciously listen and establish mutuality, that it that of course it's a good practice. And and also we know that if we model it over the course of years, you know, maybe that's something that over time they will they will get some you know, get some benefit from and, and do it in their own lives. Hmm. I'm going to use that word model to segue to more of a conversation on leadership. And um, maybe we could talk about leadership for until the top of the hour and then open it up to, I'm sure there's great questions in the group. Um, so um, one of the framing I, I had, like, I really wanted to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> and so the, the question that I kind of want to ask is, um, and I have to do it by making kind of a false distinction, right? Because mentorship and leadership, education and leadership, they bleed into each other. But I want to try to make a false distinction. So to ask this question, when I was thinking about having this conversation, I knew that we we're going to have about fathers and mentorship and development and, and that. And when I was thinking about the recent conversations Jonathan had with Zach on these challenges of intergenerational transmission, these have more emphasis on education and mentorship, which is more like you're supplying, you're mentoring to supply leadership skills to the other person. You're mentoring so they can self-regulate. You're giving them skills and information. But there's a sense in which that I see in both of you, and this could be not true, that there's something else also going on. That, that in order to be an effective leader, you have to break kind of like the umbilical cord of the mentor or the father and do something quite more radical. And I think this is, if we could, I don't know if this is landing with you. I give an example, it's, you know, it's in the public domain, like Rob, when you had to stand up to or do something different with Wilbur. I mean, Wilbur was your mentor. And then you started to lead, like from out of that mentorship, there's a crack that happens, you know? And this, I mean, in, in my opinion, it, you know, it must have been an enormous challenge. You were actually rather young. That was quite a while ago. And, 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 um, and the reason why I want to speak to this is because there's a lot of conversation about where our leaders are, but it seems like there's not a lot of acknowledgement of what it takes to like break through and, and start to lead, which is different than mentoring, which is different than Oh, you know, always bringing people along. And I think because we don't understand this and we don't recognize people as leaders, the way I recognize you, Jonathan, as a tremendous leader, and Rob as a tremendous leader, I imagine what it takes. You're not going to go out whining about how, how much it takes, right? But I think that this is, a, is not explored enough and that therefore people don't recognize. I mean, people probably come up to you, Jonathan, and say, you know, the problem today is we don't have any leaders. They probably say that to you. 
I mean, like, duh, <laughs> you know? It's like, there's, there's, there's something in this that I wanna highlight, actually mostly to reflect back to you. I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's important because there's, there's a burden and a challenge of leadership, but there's also a burden and a developmental challenge to be good fo followers. I wouldn't say followers. And I think this is not, this, this, you know, so like you had this great conversation about Comenius. Like, can you imagine being in Comenius's guild? I'm sure he wasn't fatherly, mm. right? And so, so I don't know if, how you want to riff off of this, you know, but this is most important is like, I want to reflect to you that I notice these challenges. I mm. notice that there's also in many uh, people like yourselves, there's a push and pull because the bird, the, all the, a lot of the conversation is that he's an asshole or, you, you, you know, to, to lead means you're, you're, you've leaped forward somehow and you're out there by yourself. And then, so, I, I, you know, like I said, it's not your character is to whine about all the, all the things you've had to do. But if you could speak to someone like, look, this is what it takes to be a leader. This, this is what you need to bring forth in yourself to lead. And, and here's the other thing, what are the rewards? What keeps you going? There must be, there's gotta be some, you know? So I think that's an important question, question conversation to have. I, and I don't see it, I'm not pulling off of any other models of that. <clears throat> well, I have things to say, Rob, how are you? Please go. Okay. Yes. So, um, yeah, it's, well, it's, it's appreciated, Bonnie. I, I, I feel somewhat seen and, uh, yeah, there, there is, so I, I, to give some context for those who maybe don't know me as well as Bonita, um, well, by background, I, I was a student, but I always had <clears throat> a kind of chess career on the side and I played professionally for a while and I was a grandmaster and I became British champion. And I wrote a few books about the game and chess was kind of my life for a long time. And then at some point, actually, when I was becoming a father, I got tired of traveling and I also stopped finding the game particularly meaningful. It was still fascinating intellectually, but it no longer looked at it and thought, ah, this is where life is. It no longer felt vivacious to me. It felt like a game, actually. And I saw the gameness of it rather than the lifeness of it. Um, anyway, at that point, I got kind of fortunate. I saw a job opportunity. I applied. This was at the Royal Society of Arts in London. It's kind of a... <clears throat> an intellectual everyman kind of place but it also has a certain influence on public policy and gives you access to the media and I, I worked there for about seven years and learned a lot about fundraising I learned a lot about sort of intellectual entrepreneurialism how to sort of pitch ideas and get support for them how to build alliances a lot of soft skills that are relevant to this domain um, and then after a little while I worked on climate change I worked on spirituality I came to know of the integral world it took me a long time to realize that I've been doing a lot of work that was quote unquote integral without really knowing much about Wilbur or, or indeed the integral world. <clears throat> and then um, about seven years into that, when I'd already written quite a lot and did a lot of public events, I was struggling to really find my home there. And I had to, for the second time, just as I had to give chess up, I had to give that pretty cushy, comfortable, it was a beautiful Georgian building in the center of London proper salary, all the rest of it. I just said, no, there's, there's no growth here. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of done here. And um, I was lucky to find my, the co-founder of Perspectiva, Thomas Bjorkman, who was willing to give a certain amount of seed funding, basically to buy me six months of time, give or take, to create an organization and raise funds for it. And that's what I did. And it's called Perspectiva. And that's now the organization I've run for the last five years. And our tagline is systems, souls, and society, because in essence, our instinct is that whatever your assessment of the major civilizational challenges we face, not least ecological challenges, but also increasingly what they call the infodemic, so the, the lack of access to good information, the power of artificial intelligence and our difficulty in controlling that, the increasingly private control of the public realm. For those who have, you know, in the chess world, 
there's a vision issue. Like you can often make an assessment of a position long before other people can, because you just, you have a kind of pattern detecting device that says this position's already winning or losing. And I feel a little bit like that about the state of civilization. Uh, it's not beyond hope or it's not a cause for despair as such, but you can see these multiple converging threats of different kinds, which means that the default scenario is not that good. It means that the emphasis has to be on some kind of seismic transformative change that to some extent will happen to us and that we have to somehow feel and move with so that a viable and hopefully desirable world will be possible. Now it's very grandiose. It's way beyond my capacity as an individual to really shape it. But somehow you feel that that's the work that has to be done. And so I had the audacity to sort of say, yes, this is what the organization's about. It's about how you connect the reality of the inner world, spiritual development broadly conceived, with systems change broadly conceived, with how we talk to each other broadly conceived. So, so systems, souls, and society. And it's led to a lot of projects. We became a publisher. We've got a few major events. We also run the Emerge Network. Uh, so it's become big. And to be, if I'm honest, I'm completely out of my depth. Like there's a sense in which I, I trundle through and I keep making decisions and I keep raising enough money and I, we keep doing stuff. But if you ask me, do I really know what I'm doing? The answer is much more no than yes. Um, it's much more a sense of what else, what else should I be doing? Surely this is it, right? This is what I'm supposed to be doing. <clears throat> And so I said to a colleague the other day, when I was struggling a bit, I said, the well, life would be so much easier if I believed my own bullshit. And it was a line that I felt quite therapeutic to have said, you know, I sort of thought, yeah, that's it. It's that because I have these doubts, because I see, you know, multiple perspectives and so forth, it's not so easy to carry conviction. You have to kind of do it anyway. The conviction is like a luxury you can't afford. You have to kind of keep on making decisions and judgments about what's worth pursuing in a very uncertain context. Um, and so in that, in that kind of world, some people look at you and go, you're wasting your time. You're, you know, who are you trying to kid? Who are you trying to persuade? What's your theory of change? You know, what kind of, what, what ridiculous notion to think that you can possibly change the world in any meaningful way. And yet the calling is there. Yet you've got to um, carry on doing what you feel to be right. And that's roughly what I'm about. Um, and it's good to have people like Bonnie see that struggle because it is a struggle of sorts, but it's a like parenting, a kind of joyous struggle because it feels like the right thing to do. Yeah, I'll just bridge this because um, one thing that struck me once that Rob Smith said to me, uh, and, and this has something to do, I'm trying to get underneath the principle here of what the struggle is, of what the, the, the crazy, crazy wisdom of the leader is, you know? I remember, what, this was quite a long time ago, and Rob was on a mission to create um, uh, the value stacked organization, that, that economies were going to be uh, more interested in the return on values. I can't remember how it was, but it was this big, and it was related to healthcare. It was a big, huge vision. Um, and I remember right in the middle of it when I was like, wow, this is really cool you're doing it. You said to me, it's gonna fail. Cause, and, and I got the sense, cause you knew it, 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 it was from the future. The timing wasn't right. You said to me, it's gonna fail, but I'm gonna do it anyway. I'm almost gonna cry. There's, and this was, and he said it with conviction. And I don't know if you remember that. I mean, maybe it made a bigger impact on me than, yeah. than it was actually happening, but that reminds me of that. And again, I wanna reflect back that for me, people, these little things are very formative um, to, to me, even Don, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not super young or anything, but I just wanna reflect that. I don't know if you remember that, Rob. I, I do remember that. And I'm, I'm really, um, I mean, I'm very touched and uh, uh, affected by the fact that you, you remember that and that it had had an impact on you. So thanks for that reflection. Um, and I, I want to, it's a great, I mean, I want to just underscore what Jonathan said, because that's precisely what I feel like as well. And I think that what I would um, I, I suppose notice is that 
and, and this is a bit, a bit crude, but I think it's give or take kind of right, which is there's post epistemological leadership environments. Um, those are still fairly rarefied kind of environments. That's the environment Jonathan's leading in. It's the environment I'm leading in. It's the environment many of our friends and peers are leading in. But by definition, there's a really ambiguous true north. And in any given day or week or month or year, you could say, well, you know, the, the context is whatever I choose to put my attention to and whatever I choose to try to convene people to. But we can see so many different things that could use attention and so many different ideas that could be uh, any one of which could be transformational in its own right, that where do I put my attention and, and what is the right thing to do and why am I being this? And, and it's extraordinarily, in one sense, extraordinarily complex. And none of us, you know, mortals are capable of coming up with quote unquote, the right answer because there, there isn't one. Um, and it is really uh, dis- um, de destabilizing in a sense as a leader to, to feel that emotionally. And you're like, you know, how do you, how do you set that? So I think what Jonathan said is beautiful. That's exactly right. You just allow that to be part of your reality and you commit anyway, and you act and you continue to invite, uh, you know, your friends and allies to join you in your confusion. And, um, and you convene and you can continue to convene and you make that object so that part of the process becomes a triple loop process of learning within the community as to these various questions so that the community itself is equipped to become an emergent self-organizing entity that can explore these frontiers in a post epistemological way. Um, now, you know, the other two, I would say, is there's kind of like complicated, but still fairly uh, 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 complex epistemologically environments. And then there's just simple like environments. You know, if I was CEO of ExxonMobil, for example, um, in one sense, it's very complicated. Like there's a lot of moving pieces. You have a lot of assets. You have, you know, tens of thousands of people. But actually, it's a fairly simple leadership environment in, a, in, in another sense, which is you got to get the black stuff out of the ground. You got to show a profit when you're done. I mean, that's it. So if you can become a master of the mechanics of that system, which is not a particularly you know, radically diff difficult thing to do, uh, that's a very you know, different leadership environment than, than what comes later in the kind of epistemological scope. And I think that, you know, as we move into the transformation age, out of the information age, into the transformation age, um, this is the kind of struggle that leaders are going to continue uh, to have. And I think what we have to try to help young people do is not fall into the gap of nihilism that, that could come if you just say, well, I'm confused. I don't know what true north is, so I'm going to now just be you know, I'm going to chase the money or the, the narcissism or these other things like the, yeah, we have to figure out. And I think this is probably something that, that Zach would agree with in terms of intergenerational transmission. We have to figure out the systems of education, the systems of transformative educational processes that bring them through that narcissism and nihilism and confusion into a sense that like, Yes, and it's still worth committing to. Yes, you can still be a servant. And yes, here's why you do it. And that's where I think the spiritual, uh, the spiritual identity and the spiritual training really is so important, going back to the, 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 the parenting. It's a question of uh, speaking with conviction of something that you intuitively concede that is not yet there, and you know it. Um, and acting as if, you know, it's, it's, it's actually there. And I think that, um, um, you know, I, I, I'm just going to throw this in. We've been talking a lot of, on Twitter about whether NFTs and Web 3.0 is something new or is it just accelerated the old and this and that. And I think, you know, there's 
there's a kind of bullshit detector with the way people like yourself speak. Um, um, if, if you're playing the stock market, you know it's a Ponzi scheme. And it's not saying don't play the stock market, but it's like there's a way to call a spade a spade and take a stance and go forward on that. And there's a way in which leadership is, in this sense, non epistemological, but also embodied. You know, like mm -hmm. I, there, I've met people who for a while I'm like, I don't know what she sees, but I know she sees it. Like, it, and, and, and that has a lot of power. But if they don't perform in that way, this is the real problem with leadership today. You know, this is, uh, I don't know if you know the other, uh, you, if you know Soph uh, on YouTube, Soph is like the antichrist to Greta Thunberg, but they're both in the same pickle. Greta Thunberg says, here's the science, the world is, it, we're destroying the world. And you're bad people because you're not doing anything about it. And this is so, here's the science, the, here's your science, the world is being destroyed. But look, you're not doing anything about it. You're not even scared. So this has got to be bullshit. It's actually a more sophisticated analysis. It's like, why should I believe that Biden or, or who is the guy? the first one, the inconvenient truth person. Why should I believe? Al Gore. Yeah. Why should I look at the UN and they just shuffle papers and shuffle papers and shuffle papers. So I don't, I don't buy into it because there's a performative contradiction, right? So actually, so skepticism is a higher level development than Greta, like you're not fixing it, you're bad people. And so this is what's missing is this, 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 if you're saying something with spin and conviction, but I notice inside you do, you are ambiguous, then I'm like, that's bullshit. But if you're saying with conviction and you're telling us you're ambiguous, that to me is leadership, right? This is, this is a different kind of thing. So with that, I'm going, I'm going to open up. You guys can talk or if there's questions. Oh. Um, I just yeah. wanted to spin on the, the, the soft Greta thing for a second, because it comes directly out of the conversation I had with Zach that you alluded to. So for those who don't know the context, um, one of the things Perspectiva does is we publish essays, and then we, if they're particularly good ones, we then speak about it for a while. And Zach just wrote an essay about what makes the future, what makes history as well. And um, he wants to say that education has to make history again, and the particular meaning of education he has in mind relates to our idea of the meta crisis. And it's you know it's a deep and involved, and I won't get into it now, but it's a rich set of ideas. Um, but the reason I mention it in this context, vis-a-vis -vis Greta and Sof, is in our conversation, uh, there's a source that came up. I think Margaret Mead wrote the book, maybe even 1970, I think, called Culture and Commitment. Um, in which she speaks of different kinds of cultures vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between the generations. So I, I might forget the terminology here, but you have, you have sort of relationships where the job of the elders is to pass on seamlessly all of their culture unchanged to the next generation. And that can go on for many decades. And it does in periods of relative historical stability, that's more or less what happens. Um, and you have others where there's a sort of mix of, on the one hand, it's mostly cultural continuity, but there's some variation. And that would be a fairly normal phase of history that might have been true of the middle of 20th century or so. But you also have some situations which are prefigurative. And that's broadly radical departures, moments of incredible technological flux, where things are changing so fast and so much that arguably the younger generations have a keener sense of what's happening than the older generations. Now, of course, that's a generalization and it won't be true of everyone, but that's the context in which it helps to see Greta laying into the UN leaders. On the one hand, developmentally, she does maybe lack certain things. She is still growing up. On the other hand, she sees very keenly and she's lambasting them for precisely the hypocrisy that Sof is highlighting. Um, so I know that Bonnie had a particular idea of development in mind and development's a multifaceted creature. But there is something very interesting to me about that moment, because if it is the case that the younger generation are somehow seeing more keenly and more clearly what is going on and what has to change, it calls into question what it means to be a leader or a parent as well. Because what does it mean to 
inviting those voices and visions, but in a way that doesn't collapse all sense that everything we know is of no value, because of course that's not true. And this is where Zach's theorizing is about, you know, how do you convey a love for the good, the true and the beautiful while allowing new technological infrastructure to be built? How do you make sure that it gets fed into that so that it's sort of prefiguratively designed to include the best of human life and not the worst? Um, and so those are the kind of dynamics that I see in play. Um, and it, it, it isn't clear to me, you know, there are certain things I think we mustn't lose, certain sensibilities and a great deal about the analog world was really precious. You know, we may forget how much, it, how great it is to read a book. It is possible that we could lose that over time. Um, and that would be sad. Uh, we're not there yet, but I mean, there are things like that, that we, we have a role to protect uh, the dignity of. At the same time, we can't expect a new generation not to do their own thing as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, this question of whose future is it? Mm. Is it our future, like, or is it their future? This is an interesting dynamic. Um, and if I could just say 10, yeah. 10 seconds on this, back to the parenting thing. So this whole conversation is something that we're we're always aware of. I reminded of the Pink Floyd song, you know, the line where it says, you know, mom is going to put her fears into you. And it's like, this is the part where the parents, especially uh, those of us who are kind of operating in these domains, concerned about the meta crisis, have a vocabulary of that kind of meta systematic global planetary uh, lockup and breakdown. Like we have to be really, I'll speak for myself and, and, and our choices within our house. I want my children to be optimistic. I want them to not, they're already getting from life conditions and from just their soaking up of media. They're not stupid. They get that this is a very chaotic world. I want them to be optimistic. I want them to approach the world as an idea entrepreneur, as a spiritual entrepreneur, as people that have agency. And um, so we're careful about how we sort of bring that sense of, you know, change and disruption into the house, how we talk about it, even though we clearly do talk about it. So maybe we could just massage this question of intergenerational transmission when the rate of change is so fast. And actually Einstein uh, predicted that machines would eventually do the work of knowledge manage, management for us. And that, and this would accelerate these cultural transformations, right? So by the time, so in the past, especially uh, even in my, my father's uh, generation, they worked in the, in the factories, they just had to teach their sons how to work in the factories. And by the time, um, you know, um, in my, my generation, by the time you were going, let's say to college, you could feel the pull of a whole different culture. Like I went home and I didn't fit anymore. So this cycle is like 18, 18 years and I grew up very parochially. So, um, and now, and, and, and so Einstein said, so in the future, what is it to teach children or to, it, you know, into a future that's not only unknow unknown, but unknowable. So what are those skill sets? What are those, uh, maybe they're not even skill sets. And, and, um, and I'm actually kind of stalling for time. So people, as I massage this question, people, we get a question out of it. And so when I first started teaching in, um, along these lines here at, at the Insight Center, I used to tell the story of, um, do you ever see the movie March of the Penguins? Mm. Okay, so something extraordinary happens in the end. And that is, you know, first the fathers stay and, and, and warm the eggs all winter and the, and the mothers go out and they eat as much as they can. And then they march all the way back. <laughs> the fathers are starving. They, they exchange the egg, the fathers go back and the mothers have to feed their chick from the food they ate, right? And so then, then something very interesting happens. Then the mothers start to starve and they go back. And the, that generation, all these, this one generation of young penguins, they move around, they look around, you know? 
And then you'll start to see this little, it's almost like only five or six, a little cabal will start and they start to walk to the sea. Like, where does that intelligence come from? But anyway, so I used to like to say to my students, okay, so you're like the penguins. Your parents are not coming back. Like, this is the reality you live in. But how does that happen? You know, how does that, how does that, they've never been to the sea. They don't smell. I don't think that there's no research that they smell their way back. And then there's this really cool scene where they're at the edge of the iceberg and there's the sea. And again, they start to get, as a generation, very nervous. Like, what do we do now? And then one goes in. And now what arises is some pre-established evolutionary potential of the body. That's what we're meant to be. I think these, this, this kind of metaphor gets underneath what is it our, our duty to do. I mean, I don't have any, I only have the metaphor, but there's something inherent in animal life that actually provides this kind of possibility. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, your parents aren't coming back. Yeah, Lisa. Thank you all. This is wonderful. I was looking for how to raise my hand. Um, I recently heard Jordan Hall call this eldering. And Bonnie, I think you, I, I love the story you just told because I think there is something about the act of participating with that intergenerational transfer in a time of accelerating life conditions with all the interiority and exteriority complexity that that entails uh, does have to do with the, the, the way that transfer will happen is changing so rapidly. And what I'm connecting back is to the point Jonathan made about doubt. I just came out of a conversation this morning about doubt as a form of truth seeking, a kind of grappling. So for me, that's what's coming to the fore in my awareness right now is <laughs> the paradox that even though our modern capitalist world doesn't solve for doubt in a leader, that is an emerging capacity that is be uh, that is shining forth for many of us. Thank you. Yeah, great enlightenment, great doubt, or the other way around. Little little doubt, little enlightenment. Great doubt, great enlightenment. I mean, it hasn't always been that way. Like, just to add. So it's a kind of new phase of life experience as well. Like when I was, when I began Perspectiva even five years ago, there was quite a strong developmental angle. It wasn't quite as simple as we all have to get the higher levels of development to save society from itself, but it wasn't that far off. It was, it was more or less, it was a kind of growth to goodness fallacy, I think, that I was caught up in. And I sort of believed it. Um, and I was keen to impress it on others. And I thought I could... My job was to find, you know, lots of th simple goals that I assume were achievable that turned out not to be. So one was that I wanted to find an overall measure of human development. So what does it mean to grow as a person and why does it matter for society? That was one early funding application, which I think mercifully didn't get through to the second round. And, and I think that's partly because I, I actually thought that you could, I noticed all these multiple developmental models. Thought, Wouldn't it be nice if we could have one? And then we could just use it and policymakers would accept it and the science would validate it. And then we'd build our societies on it and everyone would be nice. And wouldn't it be great? No, <laughs> it's not going to happen like that. Um, right, just and, to say, know, Jonathan, I started in exactly the same spot. It was right. maybe 10 years ago, but had the exact same idea, exact same thinking. And it's uh, so, it, yes. Right. Interesting. So, I mean, I mean, some residue of that, there's some truth in there, of course, and some residue of that remains, but the overall um, endeavor was much more sort of, messianic and, and and well that's maybe too strong but certainly zealous and confident um as if i knew this was the game plan this is what we have to get with um and then when you begin to realize well you know 
the very many kinds of development and uh you know you can't reduce them to one measure and the science is somewhat contested and they all have underlying philosophies and meta theories and values baked into them um and even if you develop you don't always develop for the you know morally for the better it's often different um and meanwhile all these other things are happening in all the other in wilbur terms quadrants um and so yeah the picture gets all altogether more complicated and on one hand it's intellectually delicious and luscious and you're just wow how incredibly fascinating this is so the chess player in me is absolutely, you know, on fire, loving the, the complexity of all this. But you've got to be careful because you can just get lost in relishing all the maps and the, the concepts and think that you're doing the work. But actually, your job is to get out of that and back into the real, real world um, and sort of bring the best of that to bear as far as you can with whatever discernment you have left. And, and for what it's worth, I think, um, at least both in my experience, as well as what we've been able to discern by working with the developmental models themselves. This tends to be a trap or, or, a, or a quality that teal leaders themselves fall into. Right. And, and you tend to graduate out of it as you move into turquoise. And so the difference is, you know, you're coming out of the fragmentation of green, you're coming out of the relativism of green, you finally start to find some meta theoretical distinctions, which start to create this really complex apparatus of sense-making as you move into teal. And what we've seen, and it's both kind of blessing in a true way, and I mean that, you get so energized by it. I mean, these are some of the most powerful people in the world are these, are these teal leaders, but there's also a little bit of a curse and a little bit of a shadow, which is your, you have an ambition that you think you can kind of solve anything using that systematization and that cognitive approach to kind of understand this reality and um, what, what that leader goes through as they mature through Teal and then they start to move into all the contradictions of that, all the things that you've talked about here, Jonathan, that I, that I could talk about is you realize it's not good enough. You, it is more complex. And then you start to have an inner journey around your, your sense of selfhood itself. And so the, the process of moving into turquoise is then a self, no self contradiction where great doubt, great mystery, much less strongly held sense of self, much less strongly held sense of where a model, you know, how models solve the world, growth to goodness, like all of that begins to disintegrate in quite a powerful way. Yeah, we're going to go to Shayla, but I just want to <clears throat> underscore this. And yet, from that nightmare, you must lead. That's 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 the great event here. Yeah, Shayla. And it's massively confusing. Just to say, it's massively confusing to know on the one hand that you maybe and I've I've mapped I've done five or six developmental tests of myself for the last fifteen years. I know where I am on the journey. So. So, so the self other thing becomes problematically reflexive, like, okay, I know I'm now moving into turquoise or now I'm strong turquoise. And so to what degree am I projecting my own value system onto a leadership context or a, or a, or a, uh, a social system that actually really deserves a teal leader? Yeah. I have that problem all the time. Yeah. But here that. I got to jump on this because now I'm excited because in my transformational <laughs> philosophy education, the, the core self, which is the self, the, the baby in the crib, the scientist in the crib, its function is to organize reality as self, other, and world. In our current education system, we think that's done by the time you're six years old, that the child has already organized self, other, and world, and you're done with it. And what I say is no how we organize self, other, and world, the major schema of our psychological being, our core self, actually evolves over the lifespan. And there is no articulated method to support or train that. And that is another thing. When we talk about what are we trying to train for when we don't know what the future is, we're trying to reflect back the developmental challenge of negotiating and renegotiating self other and world across the lifespan. So you just said that. Yeah, it's not a surprise that these things shape shift. They're continue the, the question, these fundamental questions that the scientist in the crib is dealing with 
evolve through the lifespan. And that to me is like really exciting what we should teach to that. And, and we do teach to that, but we only teach to it when something's gone wrong and we call it, we, and we call it like trauma or pathology. And I've been looking forever for uh, uh, something that teaches to that that's not in a pathological framework, that's in a, a developmental or uh, well being thriving framework. So, so um, I'm using a lot of frameworks like Dan Brown's uh, three pillar model. Uh, he, it, but it's in, it's in a, a, a psychotherapeutic framework. So the, so the signifiers are not working for us. The signifiers are all telling the person there's something wrong with you. And so how to relanguage that, how to relanguage the journey of the core self across the lifespan, I think is extremely important. So I, I just, I'm just, I'm just, uh, yeah, getting high off of the fact that you, you said exactly that. So Shayla and then Brian. Yeah, <clears throat> I just want to um, acknowledge the the energetic coherence that's happening here in this field as we start. I, I can feel us speaking more directly from the, the the living reality of these concepts rather than about them, and how how different that feels. And um, yeah, this is a wonderful wonderful conversation. And I just want to touch briefly on two things that I'll be taking with me. And the first is what you said, Jonathan, about our, the different ways of relating to time and the heaviness that comes when we truly feel the impact of who we are as parents and as leaders, and that that impact doesn't go away, which is part of the transgenerational and that I'd love to hear you both speak to that because that feels to me, even in our, as we evolve into, you know, a very different kind of leadership, it feels to me like that heaviness is something we don't yet fully know how to work with. And it's one of the reasons that so many of us don't allow ourselves to embody leadership that we inadvertently avoid we hear it calling us and we avoid that call. So I'm fascinated by that because that heaviness is there in the parenting and in the leading. And then um, what you touched on, Rob, that was amazing in your dialogue with your son when you said to him, here's a lesson on power differentials that I'm giving to you right now. <clears throat> and it feels to me in the zeit geist of our culture right now that we're massively confused about that like we're not able to deal with the reality of it and we're constantly wanting it to be something different than it is right now so i'd i'd love to hear more about that and thank you so much jonathan please um well, thanks for the question. I mean, so so if to be honest, what's coming to mind is the song, He Ain't Heavy, He's My Brother. That's, you know, it's, um, there's something about that notion of heaviness that is culturally quite resonant. If things are heavy, they're generally thought to be bad. And that's part of the problem, I think. That, But actually, life is, in some sense, fuller. I mean, Jesus carrying the cross is, in some ways, the burden of being as I think Peterson, for example, put it, but, you know, the notion of carrying something heavy, being your load to bear, your load to carry, uh, is, it has a lot, you know, has, it's quite deeply there entrenched in the culture. Um, and I think, I think I'd want to say that something about being more fully alive, more fully adult is a kind of love of that heaviness, um, but not fetishizing it. So something about not sort of saying you, you have to or else, but knowing that there is qualities of experience and depth and meaning in carrying what you have to carry um, that you won't find in the lightness of the joy and the playfulness and the this won't happen againness of different forms of existence, which have their own value, um, but they're not the same. And um, I think as a culture, we typically 
are fairly reality avoidant and pleasure seeking hedonistic um, and so moving towards heaviness is something very different it's moving towards mm, self-imposed pressure for a greater purpose and when that greater purpose is in doubt it's all the harder to carry it But, you know, and I know Rob's going to speak next, but the natural bridge here is Rob's pointing out instruction, right? It's just a kind of a transmission. It's not, it's like get beneath the scenario. Also, it's kind of pointing out, hey, the world is heavy here. This is, this is a heavy thing. I'm going to, I'm, going to, I'm not going to loosen the weight for you in this interaction. Mm. I'm going to give you more part of the load to bear. Right. So I saw the reverse. Yeah. And you made me think there, Bonnie, just imagistically of Atlas carrying the globe. Yeah. Um, and that literally that globe can be like light, like a plastic ball, or it can be like made of, you know, yeah, what gold or whatever is heavy. Um, yeah. But just, just imagistically that came to mind. I, I um, it reminds me, this conversation reminds me of a keynote I did maybe four or five years ago on what I called cosmic integrity. And, um, it, it kind of was arguing for a, a sense about leadership, about how we have to always release the end, release attachment to the ends with every step. Um, because if we don't, we tend to pervert our own means in a, in a sense. And I think we all know kind of how that works and it's a paradox. And so, so much of what we're talking about here is just fundamentally paradoxical. How do you, how do you help children not become burdened by the heaviness of our 40, mid 40 something, very complex mind that thinks it knows what 50 years from now looks like, while also allowing for the true life conditions and the fact that they are changing and things are um, just historically quite chaotic to infuse who they're becoming, um, you know, and there's, and, and, and the right answer as well to probably point out how that's a polarity itself and, and to point out to them, here's how we navigate polarities. Like you don't want to live on one end or the other. We want to harmonize and, and we need to come into relationship to that polarity. Um, there's no universe to save. The universe is fine. It's perfect right now. Look outside at like 11 sigma, everything in the universe is operating exactly as it should. It's perfect. And there's a lot of things that we can do to make it better in the next moment. Um, so these paradoxes are within us as leaders, and they're also what we have to do with our children. Um, and then finally, I would say to some degree that, that, that polarity shows up with what you mentioned about power as well. Yes, right now in the, in the kind of, uh, uh, in the infodemic that we're in, one of its normative, predominant normative values is to have pathologized power. Uh, and so no, there's no good use of power anywhere. But in fact, you can't build a universe without power. Like none of the 11 sigma operating along the entire cosmic spectrum right now of being, the great chain of being, works without very functional power differentials at every single aspect of that chain. Power is an incredibly important component of how a universe functions. And so the question then is, well, what's domination power? What is, um, you know, what are, the, what are the forms of power that are really truly problematic? How do we become more skillful in addressing those or even talking about them? Thank you. Wow, excellent. Brian. Thank you, guys. Um, you know, I I've got so many thoughts, so I uh, I'm going to try to make this simple and 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 bring it into my own life. In a you know, Jonathan, you talked about that sense of optimism, and honestly, the last couple of months have been a real challenge for me. I I'm a father of two daughters who are both, so I'm 62, and my kids are 28 and 26 and they're amazing young women 
doing really some amazing things, very different, but close enough in age that they're best friends. They're 18 months apart. And, and they really, what's been wonderful as a father to see how they really support each other in, in their lives beyond anything that my wife and I could ever, ever offer them as parents. And so this is really a joy to, and we got to see that at holiday times this year, um, we're renting a place up in the wilds of New Hampshire. And it was just the four of us and something clearly has shifted in our relationship as parents with our kids, um, where really they're, they're, my younger one, my wife is finally kind of releasing um, and uh, the hold on or the fear that she has around my younger daughter. So, but I listened to John or, um, and it's too bad he's not here, Jordan Hall's rebel wisdom thing right in the middle of December on web three and the human condition and, and adding that to what Daniel Schmockenberger is, Joe Rogan and some of his things he's been doing with Tristan Harris really put me in a state of, of personal crisis of like, wow, like this, you know, what's the future hold for, for these two girls that are doing amazing things, but have never been interested in, in talking, or I've never been able to, to share what I've done. I, I, and I come from the Benita Roy school of, of, and, and, so I was just diving into the complexity of all of what they were talking about, though I could hear Bonnie's words saying, release the complexity. And, and that's where I found my optimism again. So here's, what, here's my question, if it is a question, is yesterday my wife and I were driving and we got talking about our parents. We had both came from really wonderful families with parents that we really admired, yet we had no, we were talking about our grandparents and thinking about, do we have any concept of their relationship with their parents? And we couldn't really even remember anything about that relationship with my dad being the fourth or fifth son of uh, uh, in, I remember my grandparents, but we couldn't remember their relationship at all. So I was really interested, I guess, from Bonnie's, what Bonnie just talked about is that education throughout a lifetime, because what Jordan was calling for at the very end of that, at that, of that rebel wisdom thing was the, he said, what we need is wisdom and eldership. And, and so that was where I feel like it's too bad he's not here to, to talk about that because that was what put me into my a real sense of dread and despair but at any rate um i don't know maybe bonnie you would talk a little bit more about what you're saying about that intergenerational transmission and how how we might step into that more yeah i'll let them let rob and jonathan i think their their wheels are turning so um if you want to say something like this, this, this man is, is asking for help. I, my instinct is that you're doing fine for what it's worth. I, I mean, I don't know you, of course, I don't know your daughters. Um, I do know what it feels like to watch a video like the one you mentioned and feel, oh my God, things are really bleak. Um, and I also know what it means to think, and I have a responsibility to the next generation and, but I can't possibly um fulfill that obligation because the gap between my agency and the scale of the challenge is too great and therefore what am i as a father to do if i don't have the power to protect my children so it's deep it's primal it's fundamental you're right to feel it on the other hand i would not despair um they know things that you don't know they will do things and be things that you can't conceive because of the acceleration of technology, perhaps more so than general. That's no mere truism today. I think it's literally true in a sense that 
um, they will teach us more um, than we can imagine at the moment. Not all for the better, you know, I don't want to be naive about it. Some much will be lost, much that's beautiful will perish. But, you know, yesterday there was this news about nuclear fusion and it was overhyped. But in effect, they, there has been a, quite a significant breakthrough that gives the impression that through technological means, we might, in effect, it's almost like breeding stars. It's a kind of star farming um, that gives rise to clean, uh, abundant energy um, that may well power much of the planet at some stage. Now, we're a long way. We have physics. We're a long way from engineering and further from the politics. But... It's an intimation of the kind of breakthrough that is likely to happen that we don't see coming. Uh, in addition to all the, you know, the emergent properties that are negative, when you hear Daniel or Jordan describing such things, and, and there are others, of course, who do as well. You know, don't forget that systemic effects can also be positive. They're not always negative. That that the, some of the technological impacts can become for the benefit of the greater good. I think the odds are not great, but I think they're not bad either. Um, I think we, our job is just to keep on doing the best we can. And wisdom lies not so much in some great sagacious insight, but somehow the determination to keep going in the context of not knowing what to do uh, and not, not to despair because the despair will not, will not help. Um, and yet not to be naively optimistic either, to feel what you have to feel but not to stay there. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad. I think my, I think before while you're speaking, Robert, I'm going to collect my five-year-old is at the door. Um, but I'll wait till you speak a little bit more. So no, I don't want no, to please. Your flow. Carry yeah, on. Go carry ahead. On. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm very optimistic, and I'm probably more optimistic than than most of the people that kind of run in the communities that we tend to run in. And I suppose that optimism comes from number one, a deep epistemological humility. I think most of what we're much of what people are saying is just not is going to turn out to be wrong in unpredictable ways. Number two, we see a an incredible explosion of uh, exponential technologies and game-changing technologies in the transformation age. Um, Jonathan mentioned free power, which our children will probably see in their lifetime, free global power. It'll, com it'll completely change the nature of the techno economy. Uh, we're going to see our kids have the chance to live past 100 years, probably fairly easily with, with genetic, genetically customized, personalized medicine. Um, the amount of obviously computing power and quantum computing and AGI that comes online in the next 30 to 40 years will, I mean, these are just really sort of fundamental. They change the nature of, of human life as we know it. And I do believe that stressed vines make the best wine. Uh, you know, humanity has always tended to step up in the face of significant adaptive problems and figure things out. And I, I, I believe that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the conversation that tends to be pessimistic ignores what actually is already going on in the world. Uh, it, it ignores a lot of what very smart people are already doing. They're bringing it into the corporate sphere. They're bringing, they, they are, you know, they're creating circular economies. Crypto and web three are doing interesting things as it relates to solving the problems of web two. I mean, this is just how the evolutionary dialectic works. And so, um, you know, I'm very optimistic, but I mean, clearly these are serious challenges and they're worth talking about, but I think, opt I think, um, I think it's ethical to be optimistic. I actually, I actually find it a little bit unethical to be pessimistic, um, for a lot of reasons in terms of how we, we entrain the next generation to think about their own lives. It's, it's interesting just to add, Rob, I, I I'm not sure I'm either optimistic or pessimistic. It's sort of the quality I look for is something I once called reflexive realism, which is maybe quite similar to what you're saying, but it's a reflexive realism. I mean that there's a kind of mind to world relationship that means that, that you take responsibility for what is real, such that to be realistic is to be creative. 
And that's a kind of optimism. It's not exactly an assessment right. that things would be great, but it's like your responsibility is to make them better. So even if your prognosis is relatively bleak for whatever reason, and I think that a case can be made for that, uh, nonetheless, the, the, the disposition and sensibility is more optimistic in nature because it's like, well, my responsibility is to shape the reality and not merely predict it. Right. Um, right. But I, yeah. Exactly. Joshua? Hi, um, thank you both. Um, I guess uh, I'm a father of two children, 13 and 11, born to grow. Um, I'm just, I mean, it's been always with me this question, but I think recently I've been reading some books and it's basically uh, the idea of how I embody masculinity as I show up as a father. And I was, um, I'd like to hear maybe what you guys <laughs> have to say about that. tough one um i i i'm often invited to go to men's retreat weekends so the rebel wisdom crowd in the uk and periodically i get asked to go to their men's men's groups and i tend not to want to um now i'm not saying that's masculinity as such but it's interesting just as a intuition pump because i'm not sure i rev i i don't think that much about what it is to be a man i was brought up by a single mother i'd say my family is is if anything matriarchal rather than patriarchal although it, it wouldn't go so far as to call it that but i i've always been i've had quite a lot of female friends throughout my life i don't know if these things represent masculinity but i suppose what i mean is my way of being male is something about being quite comfortable around women actually um and if that's if that's being masculine, I don't know, but that's somehow how I like to do it. One of the things that Perspectiva tries to do and doesn't always succeed is just in a fairly male dominated space, give enough time to, to those who are not male. Now that's, there is of course, masculine and feminine energy. It's nothing to do with the genders or the sexes as such. Um, but what does it mean to me masculine? I'm not sure. I, it's a question I almost, I, I find I've probably got some kind of shadow work to do there because I feel uncomfortable about the very question. Yeah, I guess I would, I would um, pick up where, where Jonathan mentioned the uh, masculine and feminine energies because um, also implicit in, in Jonathan's answer is the, que is the question of, well, what does it mean to be, to be masculine or to be feminine? And so we have to have some orienting framework to say, well, this is kind of what I mean in the question. So for us as a family, uh, you know, I take a fairly classically integral view that these are energies within us. We have a masculine energy, which has, which uh, we've classically defined or described as uh, having agency. It's about the, the wholeness aspect of the whole on. Um, and it is, uh, it, it tends to assert rights and rights are just another way of, of understanding the whole ons. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's energy towards defining the boundary, the self other boundary. So as a whole on, I've got rights, here's my boundary. Uh, and this is, this is agency. And that tends to be described in a kind of a masculine way. And then the feminine energy is uh, rather than agency, it's communion. So how how are we, instead of a whole, how are we a part? What is the partness? Uh, and instead of rights, it's responsibilities. And notice these are all polarities, right? So we, we, we have this feminine energy, the sense of responsibility. And so with, with all of our um, children, what we look at is each one, as I mentioned early on, each one is coming into the world with kind of their own innate typologies and instincts and structures and patterns. Uh, so what we look at is how do we help round those out? How, you know, is there a way in which, so for example, with my daughter uh, early on, I did a lot of work with her around agency or a lot of work with her around boundary setting. Um, and it turns out it was not a problem at all. Like now she's 12. I'm like, Oh, she's got no problem with boundaries. So good work there. Now we have a different, now we have a different thing, but, but it's a constantly dynamic navigation. And so the way we, we worked with her is made sure she was in jujitsu, made sure she was really comfortable with real, literally physical rough and tumble, you know, 
taking a punch, like actually being able to be in the mix of the energetic exchange in terms of that boundary. And, and so I think that actually quite helped her, uh, you know, balance out some of those, those things. Now with my boys, um, it was very much around, here's how a gentleman acts. Here's how you are responsible for what's going on in your environment. Here's how you are, you are submitting your own will and putting it lower than what you're in service to inside the environment you're in. You hold the door for your mom. If you don't, you get whacked on the head. For example, you know, it's very pre-conventional and, you know, with my boys, like I, I was raised in the South and that's just how they're going to be raised as gentlemen. But it's a sense of how to be emotionally open and vulnerable um, how to, again, how to sort of navigate these things of, of, of power in a skillful way. I mean, the fact that my 14 year old, he's, he's getting bigger, stronger. Um, is he using that power properly with, with his siblings? And so though, just having that framework allows us to then constantly kind of dynamically steer as, as we see each one on the journey of their psychosexual maturation and, and, and their identity with, with regard to that. Joshua, I, I thank you, Rob. And I, I just wanted to, I wasn't very satisfied with my answer and I had two little anecdotes to sort of bolster the last one moments where I felt sort of parental pride and actually a kind of masculine pride, actually. So the first was um, my book launch. I wrote a sort of memoir, what chess taught me about life a book called the moves that matter. And that was published in November of uh, 2019. And my, I made, my older son was at the book launch and I, I felt really proud to, to sort of share with him this moment of a kind of life story and managing to put it into print and sharing it with the community and having something to say. And he watched me give the speech. And there I felt something like masculine pride, I think. And the second moment was um, my brother sadly recently died and I had to give the, the eulogy at the funeral. And there was a moment we weren't going to take our children to the funeral at all because, you know, it's a dark occasion and it's a lot to manage. And originally, but my older son actually said, look, I really should be there. He said, you know, it's, he's my uncle. I didn't know him very well, but still uh, I really want to be there. Um, and so very last minute, we were getting a sleeper train and we called up the sleeper and got him on. And like, we were there in the taxi two minutes later and bang. Anyway, in the funeral the next day, I gave the speech. It went reasonably well. And I was just very, very proud. He was in the, in the room to see me take on that responsibility. And then finally, um, since you mentioned the Enneagram, again, I'm a, kind of a beginner to the Enneagram, but I'm pretty sure I'm a five for what it's worth. Um, and the reason I mentioned that now is apparently one of the things that sort of helps the five is sort of embodied service and out of the head and in the real world and so forth. There are moments on Wednesday morning, in particular Wednesday morning, where my wife Shiva has to get the boat quite early. Um, my, and I, I wake up at six and I make my older son breakfast. And then quite soon after that, I have to help Shiva get ready, usually finding all sorts of things that have been lost, making sure she also has food to take with her when she gets on the boat. And then just after she's dropped off, I walk back home and then my younger one, Vishnu, whom you've just seen is up and I have to get him ready for school. And I drop him off at school about nine. And those three hours between six and nine are almost entirely, you know, karma yoga, let's say they're kind of their service. And afterwards I feel like fantastic. I feel utterly at ease with the world. Um, and I'm ready for the sort of intellectual and management work I have to do afterwards. But it's fascinating to watch that at those moments, I feel quite manly, actually. Like it's a, it's a service, but it's a very dedicated, protective, primal, my job is to look after these people kind of service. So uh, that's a slightly better answer than the previous one. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to call a wrap here. I mean, this is such a beautiful, warm, personal conversation. Um, very, very delighted i mean I've, it's just been fantastic i don't know so rob and jonathan did you want to just something that may be in you that you know i know that feeling when you wrap up too soon and there's just one thing that you really wish you had presented so uh we we'll just give you an opportunity um yeah to see if there's something that wants to flow forth I've done nothing but speak the whole time. So I have very little to say other than you're all perfect. Uh, love you all. Thank you for the time. And um, 
I hope you enjoyed your time with us. Likewise, I'm just very grateful to the for the premise, uh, Bonnie, for seeing that possibility. And uh, um, it's it's. I mean, I noticed moments there where I'm coming quite close to tears, and and I think those are there's something about that that is worth exploring in future. That actually, when you're closest to your tears, you're closest to what matters in life. Um, and so, conversations that bring us to that point are are to be to be welcomed. Yeah, and I'll just Your say next book, Conversations That Matter. Yeah, the conversation. And I just want to say also what I think is fantastic about this conversation is you, there was no sense in which one was, what one person said was requiring that person. There was no sense that you both were trying to find the generalized person that we were going to talk about. And the beauty of the intimacy that grew from showing up and answering authentically I think is very special for experience for me and, and I just couldn't be happier. And I thank you for your time and for the people you are. Thank you, Bonnie. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Thank, thank you, you so much, okay. everyone. Thank you. That was right. so good. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Bye.